Do you believe in the paranormal? Or do you just ignore the shadowy figures that open your doors and whisper in your ear? This world is a strange one. Talented up and coming narrator, Mr. X Dreams, joins us tonight as we dive into some of my favorite stories. Stories of the paranormal and supernatural. I've seen way too many videos and photos of unexplainable things, thanks top fives. Not to believe that there are powers beyond our own that work when we least expect it. So, enjoy these 10 stories and be sure to subscribe to Mr. X Dreams via the link in the description if you love that mm, moist voice. Number one, Bath Time Terror, submitted by AJ. I was home alone one evening. The rest of my family had gone out to do something that I didn't really care for, so I decided not to join them. Once they left, I thought it'd be a good time to enjoy a nice, solitary bath. As I let the tub fill up, I let my dog out in the yard as she needed to go out. Then I went to get a towel for my bath. Suddenly, I began to hear my dog barking like crazy outside. I assume it's a squirrel or something like that. After another minute or two of her barking like that, I decide she's probably done and I bring her back inside. Nothing seems wrong with her when she comes back, so I close and lock the door and turn off the porch light. Then I crawled into my bath without any further issues, but something about the entire situation gave me a bad vibe. Now, the back door to the house, where I take the dog out at, it has an incredibly loud screech you can hear throughout the entire house, even from behind closed doors. As I begin to relax and sink into the tub, I hear the door screech open very slowly. I go numb at the sound of it, Thoughts begin to race through my head. Is this really happening, I think? Someone is breaking into my home. Then, seconds later, I hear footsteps coming up the first flight of stairs. I need to act right now. I hopped out of the bathtub, locked the door, and turned off the lights. Now I was in the corner, in the dark, absolutely terrified. The footsteps on the stairs disappeared, but only for a few moments. When they returned, they were right in front of the bathroom door. My heart is pounding. I was sure I was sweating on my already moist body. And then the doorknob began to turn. I'm doing everything I can not to scream, to make no noise. And surprisingly, I succeeded. My thought was, if I made no sound, Whoever it was would eventually go away, and to my immense relief, the footsteps then turned and went back downstairs. I had survived it. Still panicking though, I told myself this wasn't actually happening, and that if I went downstairs, there'd be nothing there. So I mustered up my courage, and I slowly walked down the stairs, fully expecting to see some burglar walk into my view. I looked at the back door, and the door was completely closed, and still locked. But that's impossible, I thought. I heard the door creak, like I've heard it a million times before, except this time, it was long and slow, as if someone was trying their best not to be heard. And what was even scarier was the fact that I never heard it a second time, which meant whoever was here never left the house. I locked myself in my bedroom for the rest of the night, and when my family came home, I ran to them and told them everything that had happened. They took me at my word and searched the entire house, but no one was there. There was no sign that anyone had been there. This made no sense to me. To this day, I'm confused and terrified about what actually happened. Was it my imagination? Was it the world's weirdest break-in? Or was it a spirit entering my home and deciding not to leave? For now, all I can really say is I never stay home alone anymore. Number two, Ghostly Savior, narrated by Mr. X Dreams. 
Dear Mr. X, My name is Kelly, and I want to tell you about the time I almost died. This story takes place on July 4th, 2006. At least, that's where it starts. I was living with my husband on a military base out in the northeastern United States. He was in the army. He had taken a couple of weeks off on leave, and we were about halfway through our mini vacation. We spent some time with his family and were on our way to Tennessee to visit my grandmother. We drove a big white van. I don't remember the make. A Chevy, I think. It was kind of an older model. My grandmother lived out in the country. The only route to get all the way out there was by taking these narrow country roads. Despite my being accustomed to traveling them, I could never quite bring myself to relax. Never enjoyed the trip. I couldn't imagine a worse place to break down or have an accident, so I was always extra vigilant when we went through there. As my husband drove along, I stared out the window at the greenery passing by. I was never really the talkative type, but especially when we were on the road. I didn't want any distractions complicating our safe trip. We made a soft turn, gradually revealing a beautiful open field bisected by a long stretch of road. Feeling unusually calm, I heard a faint voice whispering into my right ear. Keep your legs up. I instinctively pulled my legs up propping them up on the seat, which was just big enough for me to do so. As soon as I caught myself dropping my guard, I snapped out of it and put my legs back down. I felt perplexed as to why I would ever get comfortable enough to do such a thing on this normally nerve-wracking journey. I chalked it up to my imagination because the only thing that was to my right was the passenger side window of the van. A few minutes later, I heard it again. Keep your legs up. Once again, my legs slid up onto the seat. Partway through the motion, I noticed it and consciously pushed them back down to the floor. I looked around somewhat frantically as I felt more and more creeped out by the whole situation. I started wondering if there really was someone talking to me in the van. I looked behind me and saw my two-year-old daughter sleeping peacefully in her car seat. I sat there for a moment, staring at her and trying to make logical sense of my predicament when I hear it for a third time. Keep your legs up. The voice sounded more urgent than before. Not louder, just more imperative. Again, my legs reacted before I could prevent them. I put them back down a moment later. I looked over at my husband and asked him, Did you say something? Huh? No, babe, I didn't say anything. Why? I shrugged brushing the conversation off as we made a turn off the long road. I thought you were talking to me. No, it wasn't me. We passed a gas station along the road, and I heard the voice one final time, more sternly than ever. Keep your legs up. This time I obeyed and didn't put my legs back down. As soon as they were up, I felt the sudden urge to brace myself for impact. My husband had to make a split-second choice as a vehicle abruptly swerved towards us from the oncoming lane. It was either a head-on collision or into the ditch with us. Needless to say, he chose the ditch. We hit a shallow dip, followed by a steeper one which sent us airborne for what felt like about five seconds. Before the tires got back down to the ground, we smashed into a tree, 55 miles per hour. My head collided with the dashboard and knocked me out cold. I awoke to the sound of my daughter's terrified screaming and crying. My husband's voice echoed in my head as I started to see light again. Are you alright? Yeah. I felt a pain in my legs like nothing I'd ever experienced. Still severely disoriented, I tried putting them back down onto the floor, but something was in the way. As my vision cleared slowly, I looked down at my feet to see what was blocking them. My eyes widened at the sight. The impact with the tree had crushed the entire floorboard to the point where it was touching the bottom of my seat cushion. The dashboard was only inches away from my legs as they were pressed against my chest. The passenger side door next to me was crumpled and pinned against a barbed wire fence. With the help of my husband and two good Samaritans, all three of us managed to get out of the wrecked vehicle. One of the men who happened to see the accident called an ambulance. 
I held my daughter so tightly, calming her down as we sat alongside the ditch, waiting for more help to arrive. Once we made it to the hospital, the nurses began the standard battery of tests to make sure we didn't have any unseen injuries. When the doctor came into my room, he said, You were quite lucky keeping your legs up against you. I gave him a puzzled look, still in a haze of disbelief. He sat down in a small plastic chair. If you kept them both down, not only would you have lost them both, but your unborn baby would have likely died due to massive blood loss. It's a miracle that all three of us managed to walk away from that horrific crash with nothing more than a few minor cuts and bruises. The worst we got was my husband getting a few stitches in his knee. I don't know what it was that kept telling me to keep my legs up, but I'm definitely grateful I listened. Number 3. The Manor. Submitted by Cat Loafer. When I was still in 7th grade, there was this old building called The Manor. This place was for kids with mental problems, but really anyone could be put in there. But the place closed in 2012 because one of the workers harassed some of the kids there. Years after that, my close friends at the time chose to break into the school part. They invited me to join them. I was never really creeped out by the place and I was ready to show off due to that fact, so I was happy to join them. The first few times we went, there was nothing to it and we didn't really find or see anything creepy. Just an old school that had cells in some places. But on one occasion, I found a way to get into the dorm room areas. And of course, without a moment's hesitation, my friends and I all decided it'd be fun to go in there. And that's when it all went to hell. At first, I was with two of my friends, one of which I had trouble getting along with sometimes, and the other I was very close to. But before we knew it, there were two more people with us. We were just talking about such and such random topics, walking around the dorm hallways. Then, when I turned towards my friends at one point, there were two other people behind them, kids our age. It really startled me. I didn't get the best look at them because it was so sudden, but from what I did see, those children appeared sad and pale. When I blinked, they disappeared. It was the first time that place had actually scared me. A few minutes later, we split up to explore different rooms, and that meant two of us went into the same cafeteria. The room was massive, and we were at opposite ends, but we both stopped dead in our tracks when we heard the sounds. The sounds of dozens of different footsteps, of laughter, of crying. For about three seconds, those noises seemed to be all around us, and we had no idea where it was coming from. Needless to say, we got out of that cafeteria pretty fast. On a different occasion, when we later explored that same building, we had the stupid idea of bringing a Ouija board. After playing with it for a while, our group of friends got bored with it, and one of us decided it'd be fun to taunt whatever entities were there. I don't think she actually believed in ghosts and was just fooling around, but I kid you not, as she laughed by herself and teased the ghosts, the planchette slid from her fingers and began to spell B-A-D on the board. It spelled bad over and over in front of us, and the girl who had been messing with it began to cry. We had set up the Ouija board in the cafeteria. Yep, the same creepy hotspot that I told you about before. So when we suddenly heard the sound of knives falling in the cooking room, that's when we all decided to call it a night. Leaving the Ouija board there, we all took off running out of the building. The next day though, I came back with one friend. We explored some of the back offices that we hadn't been to yet, and there we found a pile of keys and name tags of the workers. I looked through them, and I saw something that made my blood run cold. There was a name tag that read, Tam. That's my name. That night, when I arrived home, I found a giant bruise on my leg, 
a bruise I never remembered getting, and it was huge, about the size of a softball, and it was tender to the touch. I think it was a good thing that the next time we went to that building, we got caught by the security and threw out, because who knows what would have happened if we just kept coming there, frustrating the entities that had already had enough. Number four, Ghost of Red Hill Road, submitted by Mr. X. Hello, Mr. X. My name is James. I had a pretty crazy thing happen to me back in 2006. I live in South Central Kentucky. Ever since I was a kid, I'd always wanted to become a police officer. When I had the chance to apply at a local precinct, I jumped at the opportunity and was fortunate enough to get hired. The sheriff advised me to get used to working late nights because that was usually where they put the new deputies. I had about two weeks to get my body on that schedule before starting my shift work. So my best friend Eddie decided to help me with my transition by driving around with me late at night, getting me more familiar with the rural back roads. I wanted to know the streets as well as I could before going on patrol and responding to calls. It was early November, a chilly night around 3 a.m. We were on a narrow country road in the middle of nowhere. The sky was totally clear and the moon was full and bright. We came up on a long, dusty offshoot called Red Hill Road and saw a person standing on the right shoulder, far up ahead. It was particularly odd because there were no houses anywhere near that area. Eddie seemed hesitant as I slowed the car down a bit to get a better view. I looked down at my phone and noticed that there was absolutely no signal. As we got closer to the figure, we could see it was a woman. She was wearing a white dress that fluttered around her feet as she appeared to stagger along the path. By the look of her, I assumed that she was either drunk or high. Whatever the case, something was definitely wrong, off about her. I suggested that we check on her and give her a ride if necessary. Once we got to within about a hundred feet of her, we noticed she was walking as if she was either severely crippled or severely drunk. Her back was facing us as she was walking in the same direction we were driving. Her body was in a sort of partially crumbled posture. I pulled the car up a little bit closer to her when we both noticed something else. Each of us blurting out something along the lines of, holy crap, she doesn't have any f***ing legs. We couldn't believe our eyes. The feeling was totally surreal. I suddenly began to doubt myself and everything around me. I never believed in the paranormal. I thought only morons and crazy people thought ghosts were real. We were both in shock. I stopped the car, and we both just took a moment to absorb the information. She staggered along down the road with her back still facing us. The more we watched, the faster our breathing became. We were basically freaking out at this point. My high beams were on, and I turned my bright spotlight onto her position. I noticed that the light wasn't really reflecting off of her, but seemed to pass through her body, as if she was translucent. For some reason, instead of turning around, I decided to keep driving past her. I don't know, maybe I didn't feel like the situation was even really happening, so I slowly kept on rolling by. She was only about three feet away from the car on the passenger's side. I looked at Eddie and realized that he was leaning as far away from the window as he could, nervously clutching a pistol in his lap as we passed by. His back was pressed hard into my shoulder and the side of my seat. The woman's head was drooping down and we couldn't see her face at all due to her long black hair being in the way. Her dress was extremely tattered, and both of her legs ended at the knee. Eddie was starting to lose his composure. When we'd passed her by about 25 feet, I told Eddie to keep his eyes on her while I pulled off the road to make a U-turn. I looked away to make sure there was no oncoming traffic, and Eddie took his eyes off of her for just a moment. He looked at her again and said, She's gone. I pulled around and saw that she had vanished. We went along the road shining my spotlight into the ditch off to the side, and found nothing. There was no way she could have gotten out of sight that fast, no matter how quickly she moved. There was basically nowhere to hide out there. 
The woods off the road were at least 500 yards away. We drove around the area still in disbelief and didn't see her again. After a few more minutes, we decided to go home and process what we had just seen. Nearly 10 years later, I was still working the night shift as a sheriff's deputy. I stopped at a local gas station for coffee when I noticed a couple of older men sitting at a small folding table near the back of the station. My ears perked up when I heard mention of ghosts in their conversation. One of them was thumbing through a book about paranormal happenings in Kentucky. I heard them talking about something called the Ghost of Red Hill Road. I thought it must have been the same thing I saw all those years ago. I struck up a conversation with the two guys, and they told me the woman was supposedly murdered by her sister on her wedding day. It was a crime of jealousy, as the woman's sister wanted to marry her fiancé. She was stabbed over 50 times with a large kitchen knife. That explains the white dress and how torn and tattered it was. In an odd way, it felt good to know that Eddie and I weren't the only ones to have seen her. Apparently, there had been many sightings of her over the past hundred or so years. One of the old guys even gave me his wife's phone number, saying that she had seen the ghost back in the mid-70s. I called her up, and she described the woman exactly as I remembered seeing her. After all that, I can say I firmly believe in ghosts. Always will. Even if you ask me on my deathbed, I'll swear on everything I love that this is real. If there was any way to prove it, I would. Anyway, thanks for listening, Mr. X. Sincerely, James. Number 5. The Lady in Pink. Submitted by J. Hound. I work for a small business in a little suburb in Sydney, Australia. We're pretty friendly with all our customers, and I can recognize a lot of people by face, if not by name. Just to give you a quick layout, when you walk in the shop, there's an open area where we set up small displays. On the immediate left, tucked into a sort of alcove, is a floor to ceiling display, with products stacked on shelves, and then to the back there's a front L-shaped counter, with the bottom of the L-shaped on one wall of the alcove. There are four aisles altogether, and a smoothie juice bar tucked up in the back, which has a view of the counter and the front of the shop. Our other main feature of the shop, which is very well known around the town, is our absolute piece of crap front door. Half of the entire frontage of the shop are huge glass windows, with the door built into this. The door is a loud and heavy sliding thing that almost everyone slides the wrong way, and when it catches, it makes a loud bang that can be rather distracting when you're trying to work. So it was a sunny day, early afternoon, and I was working the front counter. While my other two staff are at the smoothie juice bar, sorting out produce. Aside from the staff, there's only one other customer in the shop, and I'm having a pretty relaxing time sorting out some computer work. I'm typing away when a customer I know pretty well, let's call them Dany, walks into the shop, but she slams the door in the wrong direction before rolling it noisily out of the way as per normal. I come out from behind the counter to have a catch up with her, as I haven't seen her since she went on holidays a month ago. I'm about five minutes into this chat with Dany when I notice the front door over her shoulder. A woman walks in. Normally, even when I'm busy with another customer, I'll excuse myself for a moment just to say hello and give a smile so that the customer knows I've seen them. It's good customer service and all that. So I have a second to notice this woman is middle age. She's short and blonde, and I would never forget that bright pink cardigan she was wearing. She ducks into the alcove, out of sight. There's stuff displayed on lower shelves, so that's not too odd. But she's in and ducks out of sight so fast that I didn't really have time to say anything. Danny and I chat for a couple more seconds before I excuse myself. She walks to the smoothie bar at the back, and I head towards the alcove. 
Hello, can I... I say as I round the corner, but when I look behind the alcove, there's not a soul in sight. I'm confused, so I take a quick look up each of the aisles before making my way up and down, stopping to ask our other customers if they may have seen a lady in a pink cardigan, and they all say no. I walk over to the juice bar and ask the other staff, as well as Danny, if the lady in the pink cardigan came over this way. Both of the other staff shake their heads, and Danny gives me this odd look. What lady, she asks. The one who came in after you, I explain, but she shakes her head. Uh, no one followed me in. I was about the only person on the street, and I definitely didn't hear that stupid door open behind me. Needless to say, I'm bewildered. There's nowhere to hide in the shop, and besides, I had full view of the store and the alcove and the door. I would have seen her leave if she did, just like I saw her enter, but it gets stranger. When I described the lady in what detail I had, Danny looked shocked. Apparently, a friend of hers who had died several days earlier was rather fond of wearing a bright pink cardigan. Number six, a haunted home read by Mr. X Dreams. Hey there, um, I'm sorry, I mean Mr. X. It's me, Karina, your neighbor. I wanted to tell you the story of the haunted house I lived in, about three houses before I moved in next door to you. I was pregnant with my first child. You know Bree, our family was growing, so we needed to get out of the little one-bedroom apartment we were living in. We were looking forward to owning a home, so we drove around looking for listings and for sale signs. This was a bit before the days of apps that showed you exactly where all the nice homes for sale were, with color-coded price ranges and all that. We went by one house that looked kind of nice, under the unkempt shrubs and tall grass taking over the lawn, but I just got this terrible feeling from it. I didn't understand why, but it gave me the creeps. As we passed it, I actually got goosebumps. I noticed a little pouch hanging from the doorknob on the front door. A week or two went by and we were still searching. My husband Adam started to get a little impatient. Our lease was coming up to its end, and we really needed to get out of there. One day, he came up to me and convinced me to get into the car blindfolded. He told me he had a big surprise. When he got me out of the car and took the blindfold off, my heart sank immediately. It was the exact house I'd said I had a bad feeling about. I was upset that he went ahead and bought the house I didn't like, but at the same time, it was very nice of him to clean it up for us. Everything looked a lot better. The lawn was decent. The inside was clean and painted. I took the little pouch off of the front door and opened it. There was some kind of powder inside along with a small wooden cross. I didn't know what that was supposed to be, but I knew I didn't like it. I tried to feel good about the place. I really did, but I just couldn't manage. I told Adam I felt there was something bad in the house, and he would just say I was being paranoid. By the time we moved in, Bree was only a month or two old. The first night we slept at the new house, I heard the sound of drums pounding. It appeared to be coming from the roof. At first, I thought it was the TV, but there weren't any on in the house. I woke Adam up and told him about the noise, but he said he didn't hear it and went back to sleep. A few minutes later, I woke him up again. This time he said it was probably somebody playing drums in the neighborhood. I tried to reason with him. It was 3 a.m. Who in the world would do that? The drumming went on for hours. There was no melody at all. It didn't feel anything like music. It was extremely ominous. I eventually was able to fall asleep, just knowing that Adam was there with me. The next morning, he admitted that he did hear the drums. A few weeks later, I heard the sound of children's toys blaring in my room. It was so loud, I thought the toy was under my bed. I began to search frantically in the dark to try and find it and turn it off, only to find the toy in the baby's room and not mine. The strangest part was that the toy was the kind with a physical on and off switch, 
that needed to be clicked on in order to work. I couldn't wrap my head around it just going off in the middle of the night without being touched. This happened more than once. Another night, when I was pregnant with my son, I was in the bathroom washing up. Suddenly, a large rock came through the small window above the toilet. I ran to the other end of the house where Adam was giving our daughter a bath and told him what happened. He ran back to look out the broken window, calling the police with his cell phone as he went. When he got there, he saw a glimpse of a shadowy figure outside. The cops were already close by, so they responded very quickly. But for some reason, when they arrived, the cops assumed Adam was the one who threw the rock, thinking that we were having some kind of domestic dispute. Why they believed a man would call the police on himself after beating his own wife and smashing his own window was beyond both of us. The strange moments continued over the course of two years. We would sometimes hear Bree crying even when we knew she was staying at my mother's house. Adam would hear my voice coming from a room and walk in, only to find the room empty. One time, I saw Adam walk into our bedroom and then found him moments later in the kitchen. We had to search the house top to bottom, but we found no one else inside. Adam told me I must have been seeing things. One day, I was washing clothes when I heard the unmistakable sounds of guns shooting. Freaking out, I called Adam at work. I could hear the panic in his voice when he told me to call the police. But when I did, they assured me that no shooting was going on in my area. Another day, I was in my room with the kids when I saw a vaguely human-shaped shadow standing against the wall. All the light in the room was coming from the ceiling fan so it made absolutely no sense. It was terrifying sitting in that room with that shadow looming over us. I grabbed the kids, left the house and called Adam. He came home from work and searched everywhere, but as always, found nothing. I could tell he was getting tired of me saying these crazy things, having him turn the house upside down. He finally said I was losing my mind. Over time, we found ourselves getting into fights for no reason. Almost like a constant negative energy was permeating every aspect of our lives. A few times I heard Adam, the skeptic himself, yelling out loud for whatever was in the house to leave his family alone and get out. We felt so powerless. I constantly felt drained, unable to sleep. My life was abraded little by little, until I woke up one day feeling like nothing more than a husk of my true self. The neighbor across the street told Adam that something happened in his house that had him frantically trying to escape his own home. He said that a deathly terror came over him, and he knew he had to escape, but all his doors were locked. He became so desperate to get out of his house that he tried to smash through his own window, but no matter what he tried, the glass would not break. He was trying to break through with a chair from his dinner table when he saw something outside, through the window a disturbingly tall, shadowy figure standing across the street, right in front of my house. After two years of living there, never feeling safe, we finally left, leaving behind everything in the house other than our clothing. Appliances and furniture, we left that all behind. It wasn't until after we left that I got Adam's full side of the story, when he contacted the realtor about the house. They asked him if he had a strong stomach, one of the rooms had blood spatter on the floor and walls, a table covered in blood, sticks and bones. There was a storage room filled with knives, dismembered animal parts and years of muck and gelled blood. It was clear that some kind of dark rituals had been performed there by the previous owners. We never got the full story of what happened to them. I guess Adam thought it was nothing more than superstitious people living in unsanitary conditions. Nowadays... He's not so sure it was that simple. Number 7. Weird Things Submitted by Kate Some things have been happening to my boyfriend and I over the last few months. These experiences have changed me for sure, and I think I do believe in the paranormal now. I mean, so many things have happened, but I'll focus on the main parts. 
Basically, my boyfriend seems to be very sensitive to things around him. He normally walks me home late at night and has recently started seeing things on my street. He says he sees shadows of people when no one is there. One time he even said he saw someone watching us from the branch on the tree near my home. Anyway, one night, I accused him of making this stuff up. Maybe he liked seeing me creeped out because before I'd never had any problems with my home or street. But that very night, as I was trying to go to sleep, I heard someone whistling in my hallway. I was half asleep, but when I heard it, I was scared completely awake. I tried to tell myself it was my mom, but my mom never did this. She was never awake at two in the morning, and I'd never heard her whistle in my life. The next thing I know, someone swiftly blows air into my ear. It came from right beside my bed. I jump up and race for the light switch, but when the light reveals my room, I'm alone. I was always alone. After I calm myself down, telling myself that I'm just tired, that I'm hearing things, I lay back down in my bed with the light still on, and eventually I go to sleep. When I wake up in the morning, I still can't get the thought of what happened the previous night out of my head. It's like I could still hear the whistling. I could still feel the breath in my ear. So I talked to my mom. I asked her if she had gotten up in the middle of the night, and of course, she says no. I tell my boyfriend about these experiences, and he says something similar happened to his dad when he was a child. Ever since then, I'm not able to sleep without a light on, and I don't really feel alone in my room anymore. Everything was calm for a while though, but then my mom began to wake up moody every morning. Whatever irritated her, it seemed to be getting worse, and soon she told me what had been going on. Someone was knocking on her door at night, the same time every night in the same knock. This really freaked me out, and that's when I shared my experiences with her. I think that's when both of us began to believe that something more was going on, and that's when the dreams began. I began having these dreams of a girl, a girl with black hair that would whisper in my ear, I'm back. In my waking life, I began to think more and more about what was going on, I was dying to know what everything meant. My boyfriend continued to see weird things. One time when he was over, it was just the two of us in my house. He swears at one point he saw me doing dishes in the kitchen. He even heard the dishes clinking around as I put them in the dishwasher. So when I walked downstairs from my room, he freaked out. He asked me about it, but I told him I hadn't done dishes that day. Not too long after that weird event, I was in the kitchen one day. I was talking on the phone with someone when I heard the back door nearby begin to open. I turned to look at the door curiously and I stopped paying attention to whoever was on the phone and I watched in complete horror as the doorknob turned and the door began to open only to reveal that no one was on the other side. I thought maybe it was my boyfriend surprising me, so I called out his name, but there was no answer. Then I called out for my mom, hoping that it was just her, and still no answer. There was no one outside and no one else in the house. I felt like at any moment, I was about to see someone I didn't know in the doorway or something I've never seen before. From the kitchen, you can see the living room and from there, the front door. And as I was sitting there staring at the back door, the front door just did the same. It slowly turned its doorknob, then it opened, as if whatever had entered through the back door had left through the front. I locked both doors and I hid in my room for the rest of the day until my mom got home. I still have no explanation for why these things are happening to us. I'm not sure if I'm paranoid, but something tells me I'm not. Just yesterday, when my boyfriend and I were the only ones at my house, just hanging out in the bedroom, we were terrified to hear footsteps coming from the kitchen. You could hear the front and back door open in the house from any room, and we never heard any of those doors open. 
Somehow, someone was walking around downstairs when no one else had entered the house. And when my boyfriend went downstairs to check, there was nobody in the kitchen. Yet still, right in front of him, the footsteps could be heard. He came back to my room and locked the door. And we tried our best to ignore the nightmare going on around us. Number eight, Imaginary Friend, read by Mr. X Dreams. Dear Mr. X, my name is Angel. I'm a 32-year-old woman living with my son, Eric. He's 17. I'm writing to tell you the story of my son's imaginary friend. If you do the math, you'll see that I had my son very early on in life. In a way, we kind of grew up together. This all happened when he was three, almost four years old. I had recently separated from his father, my then husband, and moved back into my dad's place, an old hunting cabin in eastern Kentucky. It was a decent setup, all things considered. It was hard adjusting at first, but you know, life has a way of moving on. One day out of the blue, Eric came into my room and I asked what he'd been up to playing with Donnie. We didn't know anyone named Donnie, or even Ronnie or anything similar for that matter. But I know kids have their little imaginary friends, so I sort of let it slide for the moment. A few days later, Eric started talking about Donnie again. My ears twitched with a bit of curiosity as he came up to me smiling. I asked him where Donnie lived, and his answer honestly left me shaken. Donnie crawls up the walls and lives in the ceiling. More than a little creeped out, I asked another question. What does he look like? Without skipping a beat, he replied. He has big teeth and he wears makeup. What the actual fuck was the only thought in my mind after that. I had no choice but to insist in my own mind that this was all in his imagination. More time passed, and his feelings about Donnie took a dramatic turn for the worse. One day he came up to me and said, I'm gonna kill Donnie. That was the first time he'd ever said anything so violent. I told him he should never say things like that. The whole situation scared me. I kept telling myself that it was just a silly imaginary friend, that it would all be fine. Christmas time came. Eric was almost four and we hadn't heard the name Donnie in quite a while. I assumed he was all but forgotten. My cousin Theo was in town staying with us for the holiday. On Christmas night, we stayed up very late. Eric was so enamored by his new toys, he didn't want to stop playing with them. It was about 1am when we finally all turned in. I was teetering on the edge of sleep when I saw a low light just outside my door. At first I thought my cousin was smoking, which got me a little upset. I was mentally preparing myself to get up and tell him he shouldn't be smoking in bed. But as I sat up, I noticed the light began to get brighter, flickering against the darkness in my room. Suddenly my cousin's voice rang out in the hallway. The kitchen's on fire! The sounds of feet pounding on the hardwood floors filled the air. I grabbed Eric by the elbow along with a laundry basket full of clothes as we all ran outside. It took forever for the local firemen to respond. I guess no one wanted to go out on Christmas night that year. We sat outside in the bitter cold, in an empty field across the street and watched our house burn down. With the orange glow of the flames flickering on his face, Eric looked up at me and said, Donnie started the fire, but Jesus saved us. Donnie died in the fire, Mommy. Did you see? I was floored. My heart sank and I immediately felt nauseous. I hadn't heard about Donnie in weeks. We were technically Christian by default, I guess, but I had no clue where Eric could have possibly come up with all this. I just agreed. Yes, baby, I saw. Tears rolled down my cheeks, stinging in the freezing cold night air. He's such a special boy. He saw things that we could not see. If you ask him now, he doesn't remember Donnie. He doesn't remember the fire either. Any of it. But I will never forget. In fact, 
As Donnie grew older, he developed an intense fear of anything paranormal. I promise you, this story is 100% true, Mr. X. We moved into the city after spending two months going from hotel to hotel. It was a nightmare. All we had left was the basket of clothes that I grabbed on my way out. Anyway, thanks for listening, Mr. X, and for sharing my story. Yours truly, Angel. Number 9. The Thing at My Friend's House Submitted by Indigo Lady I was 16 years old. I had just moved to a new area, not long before this happened, and I was really happy about being able to spend the weekend at my new friend Alicia's house. She lived in a huge rebuilt old farmhouse, and she had the top floor all to herself, except for the guest room, which was where I was going to be staying. This meant that we would have lots of space to goof around without getting yelled at. We had been chilling for a couple of hours and were in the middle of watching a movie when I suddenly heard what sounded like a door slam from her closet. I jumped up and went to go see what had made the noise. I'd always been rather fearless like that. Alicia stopped me and said that it was the attic door that was in her closet she said that sometimes the mean ghost guy slammed it and that if I went in there, he would start messing with me. I didn't believe her, so I rolled my eyes and I opened the closet door. I seemed to ignore the fact that her closet door handle was freezing and felt like ice to the touch. And when I stepped foot in the closet, it felt just as cold, like some sort of butcher shop freezer. Then I noticed the door in the left side of the closet was hanging open and there was a set of wooden steps on the other side of the door going straight up. I decided that the attic being open was why it was so cold in the closet. So I closed that door and I turned back to my friend who now looked terrified. She told me that he would want to hurt me now and that I should be very careful with everything I did. I once again rolled my eyes. I said if he was really real, he could come say hi to me tonight. Then I joked around about people cutting holes in sheets to be scary, and that that's about as far as ghosts meant to me. My friend shook her head and looked very worried. That night, because her college-age brother returned home early, I found myself sleeping on a mattress on the floor beside her bed instead of in the guest room. I laid there in the dark feeling nervous for some reason. Then when I finally started to fall asleep, something grabbed a handful of my hair and yanked me under my friend's bed. It was the most frightened I'd ever been. I screamed and the light in the room flipped on as my friend's mother flew inside. I told both of them what happened. Alicia looked upset and her mom looked sympathetic, insisting that I had just had a bad dream and I had somehow rolled under the bed in my sleep. After Alicia's mom left, she looked at me and said that she had warned me not to mess with the closet, and that now, the mean ghost would not leave me alone. After a few minutes, I finally went back to sleep, and other than some weird whispering noises, nothing else big happened that night. When I got up the next morning, everyone else had already gone down to breakfast, so I hurried up and got dressed, then started toward the stairs that led downstairs. When I was about six or seven feet from the top of the stairs, something literally lifted me and threw me down them. Luckily, I wasn't injured. I was more scared and rather angry. I turned and glared at the top of the steps and snapped, saying that whoever it was, he was a coward and not scary, that I didn't want him to touch me ever again. My friend who had run to check on me was looking at me with shock written all over her face, and she said that I should be more careful with what I say. After that, we had a fairly normal day, except I kept feeling like I was being watched, no matter where I was or what I was doing. Then that night, as I lay in the guest room, I saw this shadowy shape of a man in the corner of the room, and when I asked who was there, it raised a finger to its lips, 
to indicate that I should not say a word. I fell silent out of confusion, and I heard him speak then. All he said was, I want to keep you. The more he spoke, the harder and harder it was to breathe, and I was so scared that I was going to lose my ability to breathe that I wanted to scream. I knew that if I didn't scream, that I might not make it out of this. So I focused and forced myself to inhale deeply, and I screamed for Alicia. Alicia and her parents all came running in, but when they turned on the light, the shadowy figure was gone. It was three in the morning, but I still made them call my mother to come get me. I was never going to go back to Alicia's house. We did stay in contact for about a year after, but when she kept talking about the thing in her house, I began to ignore her. She said the thing wanted me to come back, that he wanted to keep me. It made me sick to my stomach to hear, and I hoped that whatever it was, it can never leave that house to come find me. And number 10, Woman in White, read by Mr. X Dreams. Hello, Mr. X. You can call me Spencer. I have a story for you that happened to me when I was in the Navy. I've never told anyone this before, mostly because I already have quite the reputation for being a strange character. My friends and family would brush me off if I told them anyway. Back in 2010, like I said, I was in the Navy. I just completed core school, basically combat medic training for the Navy, and I was on my way to my first duty station in Maryland. The barracks I lived in had a small stretch of woods that went from my building to a little shopping area with a McDonald's and a gym about a hundred yards away. There was a sort of winding road you could take to get to the shops, but there was also a five foot wide walking path that cut through the woods. Every Saturday, I would go that way for my weekly junk food run. It was November, so the weather was pretty cold. One Saturday at around noon, I started my trek down the path with dreams of artery-clogging deliciousness dancing around my mind. As I rounded the corner of the barracks building, I saw a section of the woods was unusually darkened. It was broad daylight out. Didn't make sense at all. I definitely thought it was odd but I didn't worry too much about it. I continued walking and began to think about it more. The trees were all bare, no leaves. I figured maybe it was cloud cover or something along those lines. Still, I'd never seen it quite that dark. I shrugged it off and continued on my way. About a quarter of the way down the path, I noticed the figure of a woman wearing the brightest, whitest dress I'd ever seen in my life. She stood about 30 yards away from me down the path, just slightly into the woods, staring at me through a thin veil. I kept walking. This was a military base, after all. Tons of idiots around trying to pull pranks on people all the time. It took me about 30 seconds of walking before I realized I wasn't getting any closer to the end of the path. She stood there, perfectly still. The only movement I saw was the wind gently swaying the hem of her dress but she was somehow getting closer to me. I began to notice that I couldn't see any breath coming from her mouth in the cold air. She was very tall, as tall as me, and I'm about six foot four. She was rail thin with shoulder length hair, as white as her dress. When she grew closer, I could see that her eyes were a bright yellow. Her arms were so thin and fragile that it seemed like a strong breeze could snap them right off. And her hands, Damn, her hands were like something out of a nightmare. Thin and skeletal, but twice the size they should be with what looked like about three inch claws on her fingertips. I didn't even realize I was still walking. I felt as if she was somehow calling out to me, although I could hear nothing but the wind. I finally stopped only a few feet away from her as I met her gaze with a bewildered stare of my own. As soon as my body came to a full stop, I was struck with a concentrated, piercing terror that paralyzed me where I stood. All I could do was move my eyes, which I used to frantically search the area for a way out. It was then I noticed that there were other things in the woods. Dark, shadowy figures began appearing from behind almost every tree. The shadows were low to the ground, crouched, 
I realized they were actually on four legs. To me, they appeared to be wolves of some kind. Their eyes shined with the same golden yellow hue as the woman. The odd thing is that unlike her, I felt no fear of them. It was a welcome comfort and sense of relief washing over me as more and more of them revealed themselves. I thought they must have been there to protect me. When I turned my eyes back to look at the woman, she was right in front of my face. I didn't hear her move. I felt my entire body tighten, trying to expel everything it had to give at that moment. The terror had regained its grip on me. All I could think was that this was the end for me. The ghastly woman reached out one finger to touch my face, and a deep growl bellowed out from the woods beside me, just out of my view. I struggled to look away from her and saw a massive beast, a wolf seemingly made of pure shadow, standing at my side. She looked at the wolf and then back to me before sliding one of her clawed fingers down my cheek. Suddenly, I awoke in my own bed. I chuckled a bit, relieved, to think it was just a bizarre dream. As I shifted my body around to resituate myself, I realized that I had my shoes on. I sat up quickly and turned on the light on my nightstand. My shoes had fresh dirt on the soles, and I also had my jacket on. I reached up and touched my chest, and felt the cold outside air rush from the jacket up to my neck. My mind raced as I got up and ran outside to get to the path in the woods. The dark cloud was gone. I thought to myself, what the hell? I walked down into the path about halfway and saw several sets of large paw prints. Confounded, I touched my face and felt something wet. I looked at my hand and saw the smear of blood from where the woman touched me. I saw her again one other time when I was out with my marines on a field training op. We stared at each other for a few seconds as I lay down in my sleeping bag. She faded away after a while, leaving me much more able to fall asleep, despite some continued paranoia. The next morning, I saw another set of palm prints on the ground near the camp I slept in. I don't expect you to believe all this, Mr. X. I'm almost positive that I wouldn't believe me either, but I appreciate you telling my story. If you or anyone you know has an idea of what I saw, please let me know. Regards, Spencer. Some people believe that there are dimensions beyond our own, parallel dimensions that are merely a different frequency to ours. That means there could be untold numbers of different creatures and entities living in the same space we reside in. They're simply hidden behind a thin veil, a veil that often comes undone, allowing those beyond our realm to interact with us. But why do they wish to harm and scare us? It seems that the dimension hidden from ours is at war with us, and we might never know why. Good night. Be sure to like, share, comment, and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And don't forget to check out Mr. X Dream's channel for more of his talented narration. Thank you. To everyone listening, stay safe out there and stay creepy.